welcome to Everything is Spooky in the Dark, the podcast for WanderingCrystal.com. I'm your host, Crystal, and today we'll be talking about witches in Scotland. As panic of witchcraft swept over Northern Europe, there was no fear of evil witches wreaking havoc in Scotland. Scotland did have its fair share of healers and herbalists, which were commonly known as witches. But these people were not seen as evil beings working with the devil. In fact, many of these men and women were sought out to help people alleviate their ailments or keep superstitious sailors safe at sea. This all changed when King James VI went to Denmark in 1590. When sailing to Scotland, Anne of Denmark, who was destined to take the throne next to King James, ran into an intense storm that almost capsized her ship. The unruly weather forced her to retreat back to Denmark. King James decided to travel to Copenhagen to retrieve Anne so that they could make the journey back to Scotland together. However, on the way, his ship was also met by vicious storms. When he finally arrived at Kronberg Castle in Denmark, he was swallowed up by the witchcraft hysterics that were running rampant throughout the country. The witch hysteria which consumed Europe was largely due to a single book written by Henrik Kramer. This book was called the Malleus Maleficarum or the witch hammer in English. This book not only persuaded people to believe that witches were a real threat, but it taught them how to capture and kill these witches. During King James' stay at the castle, two women were arrested for witchcraft, and after much interrogation, they ultimately confessed and claimed that they were responsible for calling forth the storms that both Anne and King James' ships ran into. King James VI was already terrified of suffering a violent death, and now he was convinced he was being tormented by witches. So upon returning to Scotland, King James' paranoia of witchcraft grew, and with his increasing suspicions, he authorized the persecution and torture of all suspected witches in what is now known as the Great Scottish Witch Hunt. The people who were accused of being witches were generally healers, herbalists, midwives, and poverty-stricken old women. People believed the witches injured and murdered innocent people by sinking ships and bringing famine and disease to Scotland. Paranoia and superstition ran deep, and the Scots believed a woman's body was at the height of vulnerability during childbirth. To avoid bewitchment, only the midwife and the pregnant woman would be in the room during childbirth. The midwife would tape up the windows and doors to keep the evil spirits out. Unfortunately, if the baby was stillborn or the mother had issues, the midwife would be accused of witchcraft. The first case of witchcraft in Scotland was when a man named David Seaton started suspecting his housemaid, Galus Duncan, of witchcraft. Yes, you did hear that name right. If you have read the book or watched the TV show Outlander, you will recognize her name. Due to Outlander, Galus Duncan is now one of the most well-known witches from Scottish history. The character in the books and the show is actually based on the real accused witch, Galus Duncan. David Seaton claimed that Galus had suddenly obtained magical healing powers, and he had often caught her sneaking out at night. The torture that Galus endured was brutal. It included a thumbscrew torture, which was slowly tightening a screw-like instrument, almost like a vice on the witch's thumbs. This pressure would gradually crush the victim's thumbs. Galus refused to confess, 
so she was also tormented by wrenching. Wrenching was basically crushing her head with a rope. A rope was tied around the victim's head and pulled so tight it could crush their skull. After all this torture and still no confession, David Seaton finally inspected her body and found a devil's mark on Galus's skin. One of the most common witch tests in Scotland was known as witch pricking. This involved piercing the skin of the suspected witches with a sharp needle. If the area did not hurt or bleed when pierced, it was deemed a sign of the devil's mark. This was absolute proof that the suspect was a true witch. The devil's mark was thought to be branding by the devil to bind a deal of commitment of servitude to Satan. If someone was discovered bearing the mark, which by the way, the mark could be anything from a mole, a freckle, to a pimple. Anything could be considered a devil's mark. Once this mark was found, it was considered a surefire sign that they were a witch. After all of this torture, Galus finally confessed to witchcraft and spent a year in the old Tollbooth prison in Edinburgh before she was finally executed. Before the witch hysteria even began in Scotland, witchcraft had already become a capital offense during the reign of Mary, Queen of Scots. The Scottish Parliament passed the Scottish Witchcraft Act in 1563. This meant that the Scots could legally hunt, torture, and execute people as witches. However, as I said before, people who were thought to be witches, like herbalists and healers, were still seen by the Scots as good and helpful people. The fear and hysteria of witches in Scotland weren't really too much of an issue until the first witchcraft trials occurred under the reign of King James VI. So due to the Scottish Witchcraft Act, torture to obtain confessions was legal in Scotland, and the torture endured by those accused was barbaric. It didn't end with the horrific witch torture that Galus Duncan suffered from. There were so many other methods of torture that people used to coerce confessions out of the accused. These methods included shackling accused witches to prison cell walls and refusing to let them sleep for days. This sleep deprivation would cause the victim to hallucinate until they became hysterical. Many torture implements were used, such as the scolds brittle, which was essentially a muzzle to hold the tongue in place and prevent the accused witch from speaking. Other torture methods include removing fingernails and piercing their cheeks and tongues with iron forks. The Great Scottish Witch Hunt in Scotland was brutal. Records suggest that nearly 4,000 people were accused of witchcraft in the country, with two-thirds of those being executed. Before a witch could be tried and executed, they had to confess to being witches. This means that all of those executed had confessed to witchcraft before facing the ultimate punishment of death. Why would any of these innocent people confess to something they weren't responsible for? Confessing, whether or not they were guilty, was the only way they could put an end to the suffering forced upon them on a daily basis. As part of the torture was constantly telling the suspect that she was a witch over and over again. It's also possible some suspects, due to this torture, genuinely believed what they were being told was true. Maybe they were witches. Maybe they did all of these horrible things. They were being told over and over and over again that they did. Even though they thought they were innocent before the torture began. Others likely gave false confessions to put an end to the horrendous torture they were being made to endure. Scotland permitted the torture of suspected witches for as long as possible to extract a confession. It was legal to torture these innocent people for as long as they wanted. After people were accused and tortured, innocent witches were then sent to trial. Those accused of witchcraft were always found guilty. 
in order to suffer one final punishment, death. Witches in Scotland were burned at the stake, and as brutal as this is, the executors had at least some sympathy, and they would strangle the accused witch to death first. Why would they still burn them? Well, the idea was that even after death, the witches were still a threat and their bodies could be possessed by the devil if they weren't set aflame. Another form of execution in Scotland was that the accused witches were placed alive in wooden barrels which were studded with nails. These barrels would be pushed down the cobbled road of the Royal Mile. Once the barrel stopped, it would be lit on fire, ensuring that the witch inside was definitely dead. Witch pools were also used throughout Scotland. These were bodies of water where suspected witches were lowered into water in dunking stools. Accused witches' thumbs would be tied to their toes and dunked into the water. If the suspect drowned, it meant they were innocent and would go to heaven. If they lived, it confirmed they were witches and they'd suffer more torture and torment before being burned at the stake. One of these bodies of water used for dunking witches is rumored to be the Norloch in Edinburgh. If you remember from the last podcast about Mary King's clothes, the loch was a toxic wasteland, filled to the brim with Edinburgh's sewage. It's a pretty disgusting way to go. There are so many different locations around Scotland that are associated with witchcraft. One place is the Witch's Well in Edinburgh. This memorial is located on Castle Hill near the Edinburgh Castle. It is a tiny memorial, but it commemorates the innocent lives lost during the Great Scottish Witch Hunt. Edinburgh's Castle Hill was the site where the highest number of witches were burned at the stake than anywhere else in Scotland. Another place in Scotland with significant ties to the witch trials is North Berwick. After King James returned from Scotland and the fear of witches began, he was met by incriminating stories of witches infiltrating Scotland. Upon hearing these stories, such as the suspicions of Galus Duncan, he decided he had to kill the witches before they got him. The North Berwick witch hunt occurred after Agnes Sampson, a midwife from Edinburgh who was probably accused of witchcraft due to something that occurred during her midwifery. Agnes confessed to witchcraft directly to King James. She claimed her coven met in North Berwick and that they had conjured up the storm to prevent Anne of Denmark from arriving in Scotland. As the torture and torment of innocent men and women was so horrible, Agnes probably welcomed the escape of death. Agnes's confession directly impacted the start of the North Berwick witch trials. These trials were responsible for the torture and execution of between 100 to 200 suspected witches. When you head to North Berwick, stop by St. Andrew's Old Kirk, which is the little white building near the Scottish Seabird Centre. This old church was rumoured to be the favourite hangout for witches to summon storms. There are so many other places all across Scotland dedicated to the history and memory of innocent lives lost during the Great Scottish Witch Hunt. Be sure to check out the blog post, which I will link in the podcast description, to find out other places you can visit to relive Scottish witchcraft history. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening to Everything is Spooky in the Dark. For more information, be sure to visit the blog at wanderingcrystal.com.